Hi everybody, thank you for coming today. Um, my name is James and I work here at the ODI, as you can probably tell from the ODI t-shirt. Um, and today's speaker is Ben Worthy. Ben is from the University, uh, oh sorry, the Birkbeck College, University of London. Um, he's a lecturer there in politics. And Ben has written extensively about transparency, openness and freedom of information. And today's lunchtime lecture is going to be about Brexit and open government in the UK. Um, I'm sure there's going to be loads of questions at the end of this, but please wait until the lecture is over before you ask questions. Um, if anyone in the room has a question, can you just stick your hand up and we'll give you the mic so that people on the live stream can hear you. And if you've got a question and you're watching from far away, please use the hashtag ODI Fridays. Um, um, then I'll hand over to Ben now and you can start. Great, thank you. Hello everybody. Um, as, as I was introduced, my name is Ben Worthy. I'm a lecturer in politics based at Birkbeck College, University of London. I spent the last 10 years or so uh, researching openness and transparency. Uh, and I thought I'd use the opportunity today to reflect on the last 12 months of Theresa May's government to think about how openness and Brexit interact. Um, I can't promise that I'm going to be able to enlighten you as exactly to what's happening with Brexit, but I think the idea of transparency and openness gives us a, an interesting new perspective on what's been going on and allows us to see um, what sort of developments have been taking place. So I was going to look at this in three ways. I want to take a quick look at what openness policies are running across the government and what openness policies um, are new and what they've been achieved. I then want to take a look at the Prime Minister themselves. Um, Prime Ministers are absolutely crucial in pushing transparency or in encouraging secrecy. So I want to reflect a little bit on what uh, Theresa May's now 12 months and three days in power tells us about what sort of Prime Minister she has been. And then I want to end by talking a little bit about an open versus a closed Brexit. Uh, a lot of discussion has been about a hard versus a soft Brexit, but another way of looking at the last 12 months is the extent to which different institutions would like Brexit to be a very closed and secretive process or actually a quite open and kind of collective one. So to start with, what openness policies exist? Now the big one is the Freedom Information Act, of course. Theresa May inherited this as Prime Minister. Uh, I can safely say freedom of information is almost certainly here to stay as a law, but what does happen with all freedom of information laws is that they're subject to this kind of constant push and pull between what I call expansion and dismantling. On the one hand, people particularly outside in civil society want to make the law stronger and people normally on the inside of government often want to make it weaker. And we've seen this going on uh, ever since the law came into force in 2005. In fact, there's been a challenge roughly once every 18 months to change the Freedom of Information Act uh, in some way whether that's to introduce fees, whether that's to restrict the veto, or whether that's the kind of wholesale review of the act that David Cameron uh, attempted in 2015, 2016. One open question is what could happen to freedom of information amid the great legislative upheaval that is the formerly known as Great Repeal Bill, now known as the Withdrawal Act. One of the things about freedom of information is that politicians often try and restrict it when there's lots of other things going on and people might not notice as well as the Freedom of Information Act. If you think back to 10 or 20 years ago, uh, the situation was very different in terms of what sort of information you could access. And now there's all sorts of ways in which we can find out what the government is doing. And this is everything from open data to social media, to leaks, all the way to mega leaks, as they're called, uh, via WikiLeaks and others. And this whole array of low cost tools has created this sort of ecosystem of different ways of getting to know what government's doing and for any leader, it makes the situation very unpredictable, very complex and uh, pretty chaotic. And then just to make life even more interesting, the last two years has seen quite a lot of divergence in what different parts of the UK are doing in terms of openness. Scotland, you know, has its own Freedom of Information Act. It now has a, a separate open data programme. So does the uh, Northern Irish Executive, uh, which has an open data programme running to 2018. And the Welsh Government also has a separate set of commitments under the Open Government Partnership. Um, also, the arrival of stronger powers for certain parts of local government, uh, the so-called six metro mayors, all of whom are men, you may notice, um, who arrived in May 2017, may be another site for kind of openness, innovation. 
as well as all these laws and things that pre-exist, Theresa May also inherited a series of open government commitments under the Open Government Partnership. This is the third national action plan um, developed by David Cameron. And you'll see that a number of these commitments, um, which the government uh, is going to implement, are very David Cameron-y, beneficial openness, uh, op ownership about uh, opening up um, the private sector, natural resource transparency, the anti-corruption strategy there, uh, which Theresa May was very much involved with this Home Secretary, um, enhanced transparency requirements um, over freedom of information, and then finally, commitment 13, ongoing collaborative approach to open government reform. This is very interesting because following criticisms from the last set of um, commitments, the UK government has uh, made a big effort to involve devolved uh, bodies in making their own openness policies. Um, as well as these kind of ongoing reforms, Theresa May actually pu pushed a few transparency reforms herself. Um, one of these was the reporting of the gender pay gap. Uh, now, this is quite convoluted, so just bear with me. Now, we were supposed to, well, businesses over 250 employees were supposed to report their gender pay gaps since 2010, but the coalition government chose not to engage Section 78 of the law. Uh, seven years later, it was decided to engage it. So between this year and next, all companies over 250 employees have to publicly report their gender pay gap. The Fawcett Society estimates there's around 6,000 of these companies. At present, according to an email I received yesterday, 26 companies have reported their gender pay so far. So we'll have to keep an eye on that. Another area uh, uh, that Theresa May was very keen to push was opening up executive pay uh, in the private sector as well. That's sub currently subject to uh, consultation. So, interestingly, these are all aimed at the private sector. Even more interestingly is what will happen once Brexit really begins, both to the policies that are ongoing and these new policies. Because Brexit, whatever happens and whatever way it takes shape, is going to consume a huge amount of energy and resources. And there's a question over whether the government is going to have any energy, attention or resources left to do anything except Brexit at least for the next two years. So there is one possibility that there may be a severe slowdown in all sorts of transparency reforms because of it. And then we move to the second part, which is about the openness of uh, the political leadership itself. This is a wonderful quote from uh, Cecilia Bock. Um, and we know the classic trajectory. All leaders come into office saying they're going to reform and open everything up, and they end up being kind of terrified of leaks and wanting a lot more secrecy than they get. Um, Two of the three last prime ministers, I think, really exemplified this. Tony Blair came into office, gave us a Freedom of Information Act, and ended up by saying it was one of his biggest mistakes as prime minister to pass it. David Cameron really kind of exemplified this ambiguity. He really liked open data. He liked to open up the private sector, but he described FOI in all sorts of strange ways, including saying that Freedom of Information was furring up the arteries of government. The only prime minister who escapes relatively lightly is Gordon Brown. He was a very secret chancellor, but he was actually quite an open prime minister. He made some quite important changes to uh, records management. So how about Theresa May? Theresa May was Home Secretary for six years, uh, one of the longest serving uh, Home Secretaries in modern times. And um, there's a bit of a row about to what extent was she open. She was um, helping to push the anti-corruption agenda under David Cameron. Uh, she opened up the Police Federation and she very famously opened up stop and search data which had quite an impressive impact on what the police were doing. Cynic said that the thing was that Theresa May was very enthusiastic about opening up her enemies, but less enthusiastic about being open herself. She had a habit of the Home Secretary as governing in a very closed way. She helped pass the Investigatory Powers Act, which could be one of the greatest pieces of kind of surveillance legislation in any modern democracy. And you may know that David Cameron nicknamed her the submarine during the referendum campaign because of her habit of disappearing whenever there was a crisis or a problem. So looking across the now 12 months and three days of Theresa May's premiership, I'd argue that she's actually proven to be one of the most secretive prime ministers in modern times. Um, she took her experience of the Home Office and tried to apply it to Downing Street, and it didn't really work. She governed through a small group of uh, advisors, uh, famously Nick Timothy and Fiona Hill. Um, she made decisions very much secretively about Brexit and lots of other things. Even the Queen expressed her frustration at the fact that she wasn't being told about what was going on with Brexit. Um, and of course, this led to her 
uh, her calling of an election and then the development of this pretty disastrous dementia tax, which was also developed completely in secret without consultation with the cabinet or indeed it appears any of the people who were running the election. So finally, Brexit. Okay, so we're talking a lot about a hard versus a soft Brexit. A hard Brexit being Britain leaving the single market, leaving the customs union, and even in an emergency, walking out and trying to run the country according to WTO rules. The soft Brexit, some way in which we can stay in the single market customs union. But I want to offer another way of thinking about Brexit. A different way of thinking about the openness versus the closed nature of Brexit and the way in which different institutions have actually forced the government to be much more open than it wanted to be. Here's the source of the trouble, Article 50 of the Treaty of Lisbon. Um, you can read it all here. It's astonishingly brief and that's part of the problem. Uh, it was written by an Italian politician at the insistence of the British uh, with the expectation that it never need be used. And the main problem is Section 1. Any member state may be decide to withdraw from the Union in accordance with its own constitutional requirements. The difficulty being there that Britain doesn't have a codified constitution. So who decides what is a constitutional uh, requirement and a withdrawal? Cast your minds back a year ago. You remember Theresa May wanted to trigger Article 50 uh, using the royal prerogative, which is the last kind of amount of monarch's power available to a prime minister normally used for international treaties. There was, she famously she said, to be no running commentary. There was to be no constant chatter in the media about positions. And here we came down to the famous card game analogy that Britain needed to hold its cards close to its chest so that nobody could guess in the other EU27 countries what positions we were to take. A lot of people had a problem with this card game analogy because it wasn't particularly difficult for the EU27 to guess what positions Britain would take um, and it wouldn't be difficult for them to find out. Uh, the argument of David Allen Green in the Financial Times was actually all this secrecy was designed to um, kind of manage the expectations of the British people rather than not allow the EU27 to know what was happening. And it was also a kind of cover story um, to, to, to kind of paper over divisions in the government itself. But here's what's really interesting. A succession of different bodies has made the process of Brexit far more open than I think the government expected or wanted it to be. The first one was the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court, of course, ruled that Parliament was sovereign, which was kind of the basis for the Brexit referendum, and that they must pass a law to trigger Article 50. And this led to days of very interesting and very revealing debate that probably wouldn't have happened otherwise. Parliament has been extremely forceful in opening up the process of Brexit. I'll show you some statistics in a minute, but everything from select committees to pressure from the backbenchers to the classic um, way of dragging a minister in front of them and uh, questioning them has really opened up a lot more information about Brexit than we thought. And then finally, perhaps with a dash of irony, it's the European Commission. The EU Commission doesn't have the best reputation for transparency, to be honest but it has been very transparent in a very kind of political way about how it goes about doing Brexit. It published a detailed draft set of guidance lines. It published a timetable. It then published nine negotiating papers. As of this morning, uh, the UK government has published none. And what it did is force the UK government to try and be more transparent in various ways and also in some senses, using this wonderful phrase, weaponized transparency, to try and lock the UK government into particular positions from which it can't get out of. And as we were discussing earlier, it was also a very clever tactic in that it also meant the UK government can't drive a wedge between the EU27 because they've already publicly agreed on their position. Um, just an example of what Parliament's doing. This is the number of written questions uh, asked with the word Brexit in the last year. 819 written answers and 55 select committee inquiries were ongoing when the general election was called. Um, roughly a kind of 60-40 split between the House of Commons and the House of Lords, as well as a huge new Brexit select committee, a kind of super committee led by Hilary Benn. So what happened? What's been going on? Well, firstly, we know more than probably we'd expect to know. There was to be no running commentary, but we got a prime ministerial speech in January, 
of this year, we also got a Brexit white paper setting out the positions of the UK government. Remember, it also had a graph in it that gave us all 14 weeks holiday uh, a year. Uh, there also has been a series of different ministers who have given evidence. This includes the Prime Minister herself in December of 2016, uh, answered questions for an hour on Brexit. And I think that was the first time when I began to realise that Theresa May may not quite be the master of detail um, that she hoped to be. But similarly, David Davis, Boris Johnson, this week we saw David Davis and Boris Johnson actually contradicting each other about whether there'd been preparations. And um, we know from David Davis that Brexit is going to be as difficult as the moon landing and as complex as the Schleswig-Holstein affair, uh, which is a, a political event nobody quite understands. And what now? for Brexit. Uh, after the general election, things have got even more complicated. We now have a, a Conservative government in a supply and confidence arrangement with the Democratic Unionist Party of Northern Ireland. One of the things about these sort of arrangements is they often create more debate between the parties and they're kind of semi-public and semi-private. So we may find out more about the government's position on Brexit when they talk and leak their talks with the DUP who have a very similar position on Brexit, but are of course more focused uh, on Northern Ireland and the border. Given the situation in Parliament, uh, the opposition are much more powerful now. And so the sort of things that they've been doing before to find out more about Brexit, they can do a lot more of. And then we have the complications of the uh, withdrawal bill, the, the previously known Great Repeal Bill, which was published yesterday, and um, which has raised all sorts of questions about what some of the legal frameworks in place are gonna look like and also the issue of the extent to which this vast change to Britain's legal system is going to be transparent and open, and the extent to which both the public and parliament are going to be able to scrutinise and hold to account the government over what it does to what is probably the, the greatest legal change in, in a couple of hundred years. So uh, here's my email address. The full paper is actually available on SSRN. You can click there. And here's my book on freedom of information. Uh, I also have a open data and FOI blog. I wanted to hand over to you now, see if you had any questions. I can't promise that I can answer them, um, but I hope that gave us a few kind of insights into where we might be and even more interestingly, where we might go in the next year or so. Thank you for that, Ben. Um, does anyone in the audience have any questions that they want to ask? Okay, I'll start then. <laughs> um, ah, I see. So you talked about a sort of open, closed Brexit versus hard and sort of soft. To me, open or closed is the process, right? It's how you run it. And hard or soft is the outcome that we end up with. I'm just wondering, if, we, if Brexit, if the process is open, what do you think is likely to be the result of that? Oh, uh, I suppose one, of the, one way of looking at it is that they're not kind of exclusive from each other. So the more open a Brexit process is, the more likely there's going to be more people collaborating and influence in the process, and the more likely that it could take a, a slightly different shape. So there's been discussion that keeps coming up again and again about a cross-party body to deal with Brexit, which would be a very different thing, not just because people could scrutinise it, but probably because more people would be involved. So it could be a very different Brexit, again, in the extent to which devolved bodies are involved. It gets complicated there because a number of the devolved bodies have a very different view of Brexit. Um, so I'd say they're not mutually uh, exclusive. And of course, the difficulty is these terms like hard and soft are also contested and everybody, some people say that they don't exist, those two. Uh, ideas. But I think if the Brexit process becomes more open, as it's likely to do in a hung parliament, then it may mean that more people with broader views influence it and influence its shape. May. Following on from the last question, do you think it would be possible to have an open, hard Brexit? since a lot of people are talking about the degree of exaggeration that occurred in the numerous things mm. on Brexit, including the sides of buses. I mean, 
yes, it would be possible to have an open, hard Brexit. One of the one of the ideas about a more open process is also that it becomes more legitimate. So one thing that could have happened earlier, for example, would be that May and others could have made the process more open from the outset. And there would have been public arguments, there would have been the same discussion, but in a sense, some people argue that the more transparent a process is, the more you can legitimise it, even if people don't agree with it. Some of the arguments for transparency is it's not about you agreeing to what they do, but it's about you accepting their arguments. And it was this dangerous combination of secrecy and hard Brexit that might have been more damaging. If it had been more open about what the government wished to do instead of trying to hide it, you know, secrecy breeds suspicion, whereas openness can, in certain situations, breed agreement, even if you don't agree with, with the outcome. You can agree that you've been consulted and you've kind of discussed it. Any more questions? As you said, the EU have been completely transparent in their positions and the UK have held it like a poker game. Um, why do you think so little of the transparent positions held by Europe has not permeated into the UK consciousness? Not that many people know of the precision that the EU Commission have laid out their positions on. Yeah, I mean, I don't know where pe most people get their information about what the European Union are doing either. But obviously you have a filter in here yeah. um, via the press. So it'd be fascinating to see the number of hits on the EU documents websites from the UK, uh, for example. Um, if you look at the mainstream media, it's been remarkably absent, the EU's position is. So everyone continually talks about the strength of the UK position in absence of the European position. It seems to me that transparency is the solution to this, where you can get proper rigour, probably yeah. too late. Yeah, I mean, if you try and imagine, just, just a, a thought experiment, if you try and imagine if Theresa May had done this differently from the beginning and been more open, perhaps collaborated with the devolved assemblies more or made the appearance of collaborating more and published more information earlier on, often the really damaging thing is the sense that a government has to be forced to be open and that can affect it. I suppose in a way the emphasis on what the UK wants as opposed to what the EU is doing without the EU context is pretty standard for how the EU and UK relations have been covered for the last 40 years. There's a wonderful book uh, by uh, Hugo Jung called This Blessed Plot which talks about Britain's 40-50 year relationship with Europe and, and that's essentially how it is discussed and also there's a, a lot of the coverage is not about the detail a lot of the coverage is about the personalities and this person had dinner this person and leaked this and did this that's the other fascinating thing by the way that um so much of what we're finding out is via leaks and this is leaks from the u27 this is leaks from uh ministers who are either opposed to brexit or want a hard brexit or want to be prime minister or don't want to be prime minister plus leaks from all sorts of other different institutions simultaneously and leaks from people who want to show that they've been planning and doing the work and leaks from people who are trying to show that nobody's done any planning so there's um, somebody described Harold Wilson's government as government by leak, a bit like Donald Trump's government looks like government by leak. And, and this has been a fascinating case of that as well. Um, I have a question. Um, do you think that the older row about opening the, the Brexit would be the same if Brexit hadn't been triggered by a referendum rather than, for example, um, Parliament had decided in the first place to leave? I suppose if Parliament had decided to leave, there would have been much more debate and discussion. Uh, <coughs> and you'd hope that more varied debate. One of, the, one of the difficulties about the referendum is, and one of the difficulties about referendums, is that they narrow a question down to yes or no. And it's an extremely narrow focus on what is an extraordinarily complex subject. The customs union, the single market, those words weren't on the referendum, of course. Um, and it could have been uh, very different. It would have been much more interesting if Parliament, in a sense, had, had voted, voted for it because Parliament has sovereignty and, and, and nobody can stop that. One of the interesting discussions is between the popular sovereignty of the people's will versus parliamentary sovereignty and its right, essentially, to do whatever it, it wishes. Also because, as you mentioned, the very first, in the very beginning, the first uh, clause of the Article 50 says any member can leave in the... Um, what was it? According to the constitution, but we don't have a constitution, so... 
yeah, that's what's made it complex. And, and it, if I can just offer a thought, it's going to get even more complicated. Because mm. look at the, 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 the Great Repeal Bill, which is not called that anymore. Um, now, legally, the Westminster Parliament can take powers away or, or, or rearrange powers between the devolved bodies. But politically, that's going to be extremely difficult. And this is where, you know, the kind of constitutional grayness becomes, could become a real problem. Sorry? You say it's not the Great Repeal Bill. It was only up yesterday? Yes, that was one. Yeah. It's not called that anymore. It's now called the Withdrawal uh, Bill. Overnight. <laughs> uh, well, yeah. Uh, it, it had a, a grand title, but normally its government isn't responsible for the title of, of bills. It will also be with uh, draftspersons as well. Um, yeah. I just wanted to pick up on the gentleman over there's question uh, with regards particularly to the mainstream media because how much is the government actually just another player here? Because no matter how open the government is or is not, there are extremely powerful interests controlled by, in one case, a man like Rupert Murdoch or the Barclay Brothers for the Daily Telegraph or I can't remember the name of the Russian oligarch who controls... Uh, the independent stroke evening standard and these people are very much looking at anything the government does through a mirror that will paint it in the way they wish it to so how much is the government as I was saying just another actor in this case yeah. um, here's one of the real difficulties isn't it that that in a way even if you did bring about transparency about the process Brexit has been so divisive around the UK, the different constituencies parts of the UK, if you just think about England and the, and the very different views people have, plus the media um, who discuss it in a very particular and quite conflictual way, that actually this transparency, even if they had been very open, it may not have changed anybody's minds because it runs so deep and, in a sense, so, so passionately. And of course, it's, it's stoked by this. And, and Britain's relationship with Europe has been the subject of particular narrative for a very long time as well. This is not a new thing, but actually, you know, it's, it's lots of very old chickens coming home to roof. So even if the government had published lots of position papers and done all this, it may be that it, the message still would not get through or the government could be accused of capitulating, which is one of the things, of course, that it fears. Hence, you know, the, the comments about whistling and the, and, and the kind of, you know, the, 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 the Dunkirk spirit approach rather than the approach that, uh, of somebody who's about to negotiate. Have you seen an example of a government being open about the process of something uh, that's so complex when it's so um, unprepared? And I'm thinking particularly here about the fact that you have you know, several different elements within the government with different agendas. You have one department, uh, DEXU, which is meant to be coordinating, but is in fact led by a minister who has his own agenda. Um, so it's very that, to me, imposes a challenge on how you be open about that process when they actually don't know what their own position is and how they could position it. Yeah. I, I mean, that some of the, at the outset, some of the thoughts are, well, the government has a plan but doesn't want to re reveal it to you. And then as the transparency bit, it became clear that, not that there wasn't a plan, but that there was deep divisions about what the plan might look like. And there was a lot of questions about the extent to which uh, they'd prepared. And that relates to the fact that um, Theresa May decided to create this new department, which is quite a dangerous thing uh, in Whitehall to create a new power base. Uh, that has a life cycle built into it. When we leave the EU, we, we won't need Dexu anymore. Um, there are certain politicians who've gone for the kind of publish and be damned approach and succeeded. So Alex Salmond was, was this sounds a long time ago, uh, was in trouble with a, an American billionaire called Donald Trump uh, in his golf courses. So uh, there was lots of accusations. So what Donald Trump did was publish, Donald Trump, sorry, what Alex Salmon did was publish all the email correspondence. Um, publishing all your email correspondence, it, it can kind of stop the interest here, you know, and it can show I'm being completely open. We're not sure that always publishing all your emails is definitely always going to stop people's interest because it does depend uh, what it is. Sarah Palin did a similar thing. There's lots of allegations about what she was using her emails for in there. And nothing happened. So it can happen, but I can't remember any examples with such a big thing where the process is kind of 
um, you know, is so open and it, it helps the government legitimise itself. When the vote was taken to enter the common market at that time, do you think there was enough openness that enabled people to make a decision, I don't know, if, uh, which they realised may or may not affect their, the rest of that sum of their lives? Yeah, I mean, people always say the one thing about Margaret Thatcher is that she'd never have a referendum. Um, and in a way, I don't know enough about the referendum in the 70s, but you know, the same accusation could be made. And the same accusation was made later that actually the thing that was voted for then, the common market, is a very, very different thing from what exists now. So, you know, in a sense, that referendum was no longer legitimate. But this is the problem. Firstly, that referendums narrow the question down and the nature of the debate entirely shapes what happens, you know. Um, and often they can be very contentious. Sometimes referendums work better when there's an established set of things which people can build their discussion around. Scotland independent or not, in a sense, there was lots of parameters to discuss. The danger of this referendum was that, apart from, does anybody remember what David Cameron's position, um, key reforms were for the EU? Anybody remember what bargains he struck? No. No, everybody remembered for about 12 seconds. And then what filled the vacuum was lots of other discussion because there was nothing specific to kind of, you know. Um, Possibly in the 1970s, it was, it was the same. There was a lot of discussion about Britain becoming a cafe culture um, and about foodstuffs and things like that from the 1970s. It's quite interesting going back and look at, uh, at what sort of things were discussed. So a cafe culture actually happened. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Although um, uh, the DEFRA have released some fascinating data, just on a side note, about uh, British people's eating habits from 1970s to the present day. I don't know if you could... Uh, draw a causal link with the referendum in the European Union, but people are eating more pasta. That's definitely, <laughs> definitely true. Okay. Any more questions? I was also going to, because so I mean, you've just brought up the subject of referendums, and normally when it's something this big, you've got to have a two-thirds majority that says yes. That's certainly been the case for the Quebecois referendum, and for the last EU referendum. Um, and I mean, I think, I think it's difficult to argue the case that there has not been an awful lot of obfuscation at the start of the referendum process and people were exaggerating facts. And isn't one of the problems now about being open is, is as soon as you're open, you can really start to scrutinize what was said and you go, actually, hang on a second, that doesn't add up and that just makes the division even deeper. And I mean, the problem in Britain at the moment is, is we are a very fragmented society and we're becoming more fragmented. So potentially could be more being more transparent now actually deepen that division yes that's, that's an, an entirely possible because one of the it's not a problem with transparency but uh when you discuss transparency in the abstract you forget that we all filter information through all sorts of biases and pre-existing uh, ideas the great example i always have is the mp's expenses scandal when people ask the public about the mp's expenses scandal they didn't think it was a revelation they thought it was a confirmation of what they already thought about MPs. They thought they were all in the take. Here's the proof. Um, and I think that's very much the case. Um, yeah, the referendums do normally have some sort of lock-in. Uh, I'd, I'd strongly recommend a book by Tim Shipman called All Out War. And what you see is this kind of trickle of tiny decisions when we were discussing having a referendum, most of which I didn't notice at the time, that actually profoundly shaped it. So David Cameron losing uh, the ability to be the yes part of the campaign. The Leave campaign estimated that cost David Cameron 4% of the vote, which was the difference. Because um, it's always better in a referendum campaign to be the yes person. Oh, because people like yes, they don't like no. And it seems a minor thing, but the decision by the Electoral Commission to have remain leave rather than yes, stay in the EU, yes, leave the EU, no, was fundamental. As was the Perda rules, you know, when um, the UK government couldn't discuss uh, any policy. Before the Perda rules came in, we had Obama here, we had these, you remember these huge documents from the Treasury, you saw the polls moving in the direction of staying. And then when Perda was introduced, the polls swung back again. So again, there's these tiny decisions that may have made a huge impact about 
what was discussed. Yes, yes. The same as Howard Wilson did in the 70s. He broke collective responsibility and said, collective responsibility is a key constitutional principle, except when it's not. And then for a, they had a holiday from uh, collective responsibility and then reimposed it. And that, that's a party decision. You know. The problem was if he'd have made them all, if he'd have made Boris and Michael Gove support the EU referendum, they'd have probably resigned with the, all the attendant trouble that would bring. But Tim Shipman's book is excellent on the build-up to the referendum and quite impressively detailed and quite shocking in the extent to which nobody was thinking through. You know, nobody in Parliament wanted to put in a 60-70% limit on it because everyone thought Remain would win. So they didn't need to do that. You know. For the next phase of the whole Brexit move for the end of Article 50, um, how important do you think transparency is going to be to make whatever failure of the whole process legitimate in the minds of the Brexit voters? And I ask that in specific to the, 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 the most recent trend that I've seen, and Farage said it last night, we are being warned, I'm a Remainer, so I, when I say we, I say Remainers, we're being warned about the backlash that we are going to face if the will of the people, in quotes, is going to be thwarted. How, how important do you think transparency is going to be to control that backlash? Well, secrecy didn't work very well. So uh, maybe it's time for transparency. Uh, one of the things is that the, the government will be presumably forced to be more transparent anyway because of parliamentary pressure and the fact that so many votes and decisions are now going to be extremely close in the House of Commons. Um, so it's likely that there will be more transparency. The big question is whether people are listening or what their, what their views are um, and the extent to which people pay attention to the details of Brexit or the kind of personalities and, and different issues. And it, the, one of the problems with the proliferation of leaks and the speculation is that it's, it, it, there's a lot of noise as well around it. So it is difficult. I mean, I presume Parliament's going to apply a lot more pressure. Uh, just before the general election, um, there's an attempt to pass a motion, meaning that the government had to regularly inform the UK Parliament on what exactly was happening in the negotiations. Now, it failed, but I presume MPs are going to try again with something like that. So there might be a lot more in detailed information about um, flowing around about what's happening. But do they have to? Can't you just listen to what the EU are saying? Because they're being very transparent. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, I presume it would be wise of the UK government to try and be as transparent to counter what the uh, EU are going to say. I mean, the, the, the EU, the, the Commission has been transparent, but in a very kind of weaponized political way. And it's been a very clever kind of transparency. You know, that, that, that's, there's a great th series of three uh, pieces by David Allen Green from the FT where he talks about the way in which the EU's transparency, kind of transparency by timetable, has locked the UK into certain positions. Um, is it too late to fight that? The clock's ticking. Um, we don't know. But I, I presume in the new circumstances it will happen a bit more. I mean, it's in the specifically in regards to the 100 billion euro bill, right, surely transparency has a big part to play in the composition of that. Because if it's legitimate yeah. and the Brits are presented with a logic that says, here are the components that make up this bill, it's for you to transparently tell us which ones do you refute. Yeah. yeah. And I suppose that the thing with the money is, yeah, uh, how people... What if it's a real bill? Yeah. yeah. And whether people understand that, whether people support it, what amount they think is a good amount to pay. What that, is a That's irrelevant amount. if it's transparent. Yeah. If you've if you, if you broken, you broken down all the components of what hmm. constitutes that liability that we will incur... Yeah. And it's for us to make a political decision to say we don't care about trust mm. in future negotiations because the people are so angry we need to leave this bill. Right? Uh, transparency would at least clarify that. Yes. Yeah. yeah. I presume so. A, a again, the difficulty is that there was so much speculation and leaking about whether we're going to pay a bill, how much the bill is going to be, what's a large amount of money, what's a small amount of money. Um, that actually it might be difficult again to cut through with the... But what's a legitimate amount of money? Oh, it I doesn't matter what you think is yeah. big or small, right? You, you could have a legitimately large bill and a legitimately small bill, but transparency surely means that 
the bill is the bill. I'm yeah. not going to go to a restaurant and someone pass a restaurant and go, right, <laughs> you know, that's 200 pounds. Yeah. And I said, I only have a glass of water. Yeah. But transparency in the bill enables you to scrutinise it. Yeah. I, um, I mean, I presume that you will publish all the details of that and a, a, a very... I believe, they, I believe they've worked it out as yeah. a matter of process. It's just as a matter of negotiation. Yeah it's too early to put the Brits under this kind of pressure yeah. at this time, right? If it takes six months to ratify, we've only got 14 months left. Yeah. Why use that as a weapon now when you have plenty of time to really throw the government in chaos? Even worse news, the preliminaries of the negotiations are supposed to be over by this autumn. Sure, but the British government haven't given us a counter logic of what they have worked out. Yeah. That to me is very telling. Right? So if the EU know it and the Brits don't want to reveal the, the process, Surely transparency is the key. Yeah, from a because in a way, this is the same problem as before, which was the EU were being transparent and sort of embarrassing the UK government, which was not being transparent. Whether they change tack, you know, with new leadership and, and a, a kind of a more difficult parliamentary situation, we shall see. I think it's more likely. But that's the beautiful thing about an objective bill, right? Like if, if you've got such a powerful weapon as the EU, you're not going to use it now. Yeah. Right? You wait till that two-year deadline, minus six months, gets closer, and then you hammer it down to the point that, hope, you know, as a Remain, I'd say that you know I'm hoping that it takes the Brexit government down with them. But that would be the nail in the coffin. You, right. you reserve your bullets. But the, in terms of transparency, why haven't the British government come out of their own bill? Huh. They can easily work it out because they're part of and signatories of border conventions that enables them to work out their version yeah. of that liability. Why haven't they done that? Why hasn't journalists, I think the FT journalists did it and worked it out to about 83 billion. Uh, okay. Sorry. Sorry, we just need the... Sorry. Wait, wait. I'm really in agreement with your point, but I think there's Occam's razor here. The most logical argument is probably the simplest argument is the right one. When the one side, the EU, is being rational and the other side is being emotive, that's because the other side doesn't have rationality behind it. And that's, what I'm, that's why I think the government's not coming out. With well, there's no question of rationality. No, bill. absolutely. I know, and that's, that's the thing, though, but they don't have a rational argument back. And so this is why you've got Boris Johnson appealing to people on an emotive basis, because they're now currently using this whole Brexit thing in order to sort of like stir up a populist kind of reaction to the EU. But I think it's, it, the British government's now literally looking m nothing more than beyond a week. And that's why they're not being rational back to the EU, because they, they don't have a rational position. Well, I think that's probably unfair. I'm, I'm an ardent remainer, but I think that's probably an unfair position. I, mean, I have to say, as a remainer, I'm quite in awe of what David Davis has done in his position and to give us a lot of the information that other people in the whole government haven't given. But it's within his wit to work it out independently of what the bill is. Right, you know, the analogy of a restaurant bill. Well, you know, I ordered the main course. No, you didn't. Right, it's literally that abstract, like that clear. What the financial settlement is. Right, you might go. Well, we're not going to pay pensions for 20 years. We're only going to pay them for the, the years that we signed up to to the next Lis or the Lisbon Treaty. Right, but that's just nuance. Right, that's not going to make a massive difference to what the final bill is. Right, you could claim assets, but the assets are real. So you can go. Okay, we're claiming this percent of the asset. No. But I don't think that's going to change the bill. It's broadly going to be about 60 to 80 billion. Right? So what Boris is saying in terms of whistling, right? I mean, he's just digging deeper, but that's Boris. So he doesn't particularly care. But that's transparency, I think, uh, going back to wh what we're here for. Right? So what confuses me, and it goes back to why the journalist hasn't reported the, the transparency presented by the EU, why hasn't anyone on the Brit side worked this out hmm. with a level of confidence to say, give or take 10% either side, we think this is the window. Yeah. All we have is people going, we don't want to pay. We don't yeah. want to pay our bill. And the EU is saying, well, you can leave the restaurant, but we're never going to serve you lunch again. We've got a question on Twitter from ODI Leeds. Um, would an open Brexit extend to seeing the effects of Brexit, um, both positive and negative? beyond Brexit? Yeah, I mean, my, my sense is that in this new situation, the government will seek to be more open because it has to be and it's under uh, pressure. Um, will the openness continue after Brexit? Uh, there's a big 
open question about to what extent the government has analysis of exactly what may happen uh, post-Brexit. And I think that will be the site of several pretty fascinating FOIs and attempts to uh, get that information out. So look at the row about contingency planning. Does the government have any contingency planning or does it not uh, in case there's a no deal? David Davis says they're working on it. Uh, Boris Johnson says there isn't any. Um, so these sorts of piece of analysis are going to be uh, very interesting. A government that wishes to kind of anchor its legitimacy would do well to be transparent in the process afterwards as well, because whatever happens in the future, they'll need, in a sense, to justify the leaving of the EU and explain that it was a, a success, as it were. It seems to me the way forward has got to be that the withdrawal from the EU has got to come from a cross-Parliament situation. Yeah. Now, how easy or difficult is that going to be? Uh, I mean, <laughs> on one level, it would be very easy to do. It could be done instantly. You could set up a cross-party body. They talked about a royal commission or, or something similar. You could have the party leaders uh, and other influential figures around the table, and they could openly discuss Brexit. Now, whether they'd arrive at a similar position, I don't know. But the real dangers there are political, of course. Um, the political danger that the Brexiteers would see it as watering down, the political danger that the Labour Party or the SNP would see it as a kind of a way of drawing them in to a hard Brexit from which, so that they get the, the, the blame as well. So I think the politics of it would be very difficult. Could it be done? Yes. I mean, just to speculate, Theresa May, so far as Prime Minister, has not been a person who's been the most adept at building coalitions or working cross-party. Um, what you could see is more and more of, it doesn't seem relevant, but it is, what Stella Creasy did recently over the National Health Service paying for abortions for women from Northern Ireland. Now, what she did there was build very effectively a, a coalition of MPs across party to apply pressure to the government. So in a situation like a hung parliament, you might see a lot more of that over Brexit, where pressure is being applied for particular decisions to be taken or not. And it's going to be difficult for the go government to resist that sort of pressure with the, uh, the kind of parliamentary situation they have. But yes, it could be done instantly, but politically you could see the danger for almost everybody involved and the criticism that would be exposed to. One down there. Uh, just a quick plug to, uh, to start with, if you'll forgive me, and then a question. Uh, so actually, um, a project that my organisation involved is working on along with the Constitution Unit and Electoral, Electoral Reform Society and a few other kind of academics to set up a citizens' assembly looking at particularly the trade and immigration aspects of the um, negotiations. So that will bring together a random sample of the of the population to take evidence and then reach re recommendations which will get fed into the Brexit Select Committee and others. And that's an attempt to try to uh, increase the, um, the public debate around the, these aspects of the negotiations. Um, but the, the question, kind of, I guess moving a little bit away from Brexit, what do you see as the, um, the, the outlook being for the rest of the open government agenda at the moment? So we're, so we're seeing kind of FOI um, stats going down in terms of uh, government departments getting worse and worse at responding, and um, there seems to be a bit of a kind of a freeze on new reforms. Kind of, what's your what's your outlook for the next few years on that? Yeah, I mean, there's two things that matter with openness: leadership and energy, particularly from the top, um, and also um, resources. Um, I'm going to embarrass Daniel Berlin now, but he's sat at the back and he's written a great paper about the politics of freedom of information, which covers this. But one thing that David Cameron did do was talk a great deal about openness. And that makes quite a difference to how departments and other bodies prioritise it. And that has been absent. And secondly, it's about resources. And Brexit comes into it, of course, because Brexit's going to consume resources, not just money, but attention, to such an extent that you know, doing something like FOI or pushing some of the openness policies, whatever the attitude of that department to, to it is going to become very much a kind of second order um, issue. 
And I think the combination of those two things um, could be problematic. If there's an election and a new government, well, it, 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 it could happen. But again, whatever government would take over, if there's an election soon or, or later, they're still going to face the same kind of resource constraints and a kind of attention um, constraints. So, I mean, some of the things that we've seen, the commitments will keep rolling on and keep moving. There's consultations ongoing and things will happen. But I, I, I mean, I would, I would definitely think that there's going to be a slowdown coming. Uh, we've uh, run out of time for questions now. Um, but I think we should give Ben a round of applause. Thank you for the great Thank you. Um, so you might be aware already, but there are going to be no lunchtime lectures until the 8th of September from now. However, on the 24th of July, Sir Tim Berners-Lee is doing a talk that's going to be live streamed. So keep an eye out on our YouTube channel for that. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.